So let's cut to Bush in, 19, in 2002 talking about the axis of evil, where he inserts North Korea as one of the three charter members. And a lot of people at the time say, well, what are these two possibly have in common? Iraq, Iran, or what are these three? Iraq, Iran, North Korea. They don't even start with the same letter. Yeah. And Iraq's now out of that picture. Iran and North Korea remain as the two charter members of that axis. What do they have in common? I mean, Iran is a messianic theocracy run by this mix of mullahs, the Iranian Guard Corps. North Korea has one guy with his family and cronies who basically run the place, the cult of Kim Jong-il, Juche, total independence philosophy. Uh, it's secular apart from worshiping its human leader as a god per force. And yeah, what do they have in common? Here's what they have in common. They have enormous business interests in common. And what I'd like to suggest is when you look at these two, and very often experts will focus on the Middle East, on Iran. Then another set of experts focus on Asia, North Korea. Uh, what I'm forever wishing is these two experts would get together and talk because North Korea and Iran talk all the time and do things together. And they have a long history of doing that. Uh, they, uh, North Korea has had diplomatic ties with the Islamic Republic of Iran since the 1979 Islamic Re Revolution. Um, and an important thing to understand about North Korea is that while it long, for a long time it has had the reputation of being a hermit state, the hermit kingdom, North Korea when it comes to rogue states is no hermit. It's had tremendous reach for a very long time. That's part of what it does to stay in business. Yeah, just a for instance, um, when the Israelis went into Lebanon and captured documents from Yasser Arafat's PLO, among the documents they found were the Arabic certificates for air defense force training in North Korea of Palestinians working for Arafat. Uh, in the 1980s, North Koreans helped train the notorious 5th Brigade of Robert Mugabe, which massacred thousands of his opposition. Uh, and I could go on, I could give, I could stand here for the afternoon and do that. But with Iran in particular, they began doing weapons deals in the 1980s. North Korea was one of the suppliers of weapons to Iran during the Iran-Iraq War. And uh, this then went on, Th this missile, missile traffic has been going on ever since and continues apparently to this day. Uh, why would this be interesting to the two of them? They each have something the other one wants. North Korea has made weapons production, testing, and vending one of the staples of its income in this cash-hungry, totalitarian, money-starved, everything-starved kingdom. Missiles are one of its big products. Iran wants missiles. Uh, Iran has oil. North Korea needs oil. Oil and money. It's an obvious deal. And uh, neither of these countries has really stood still. I want to read you here. Just, uh, I leave you to guess for a moment when, the, this is an editorial from the Asian Wall Street Journal. I have to tell you, I, I came across it recently in my doing some research and got to the end and realized with a certain amount of shock that I had written it. Um, but uh, maybe, the, maybe the White House was distracted by the primaries. Okay, that gives you a hint of the date. But no better explanation has appeared to account for how U.S. surveillance managed first to find the North Korean ship, Dae Hung Ho, and then lose track of it just before the ship delivered its cargo of medium-range Scud missiles to the Iranian port of Bandar Abbas. The U.S. fulminated against North Korea, a rogue communist state that over many years under its great leader Kim has sinned frequently against international peace and, secu and security, but in the end it did nothing. This was not an especially good signal to send, considering that Kim is now, according to sources such as CIA Director Robert Gates, close to producing his own nuclear weapons. Surely any North Korean arms traffic once produced ought to command the unblinking attention and clear opposition of any country patrolling the seas in the name of peace. And one more item I will add here. Israeli intelligence had disclosed that the Dae Hong Ho, as well as the second North Korean ship, the Dae Hong Don, were en route to either Syria or Iran and were believed to be carrying new scuds. These are missiles enhanced, etc. Okay, that was written in 1992. 
uh, with a few small tweaks. Robert Gates is now the Secretary of Defense, etc. <laughs> Much of it, the same policies effectively prevail today. Um, there is a difference. Since that was written, North Korea has, in fact, acquired the ability to make nuclear devices and has tested two of them in 2006 and 2009 and Iran has advanced considerably in its own plans to produce nuclear weapons. The kind of traffic that this describes continues to this day. Um, both countries were part of the A.Q. Khan nuclear proliferation network in which Pac the f godfather of Pakistan's nuclear bomb turned himself into a bazaar of nuclear material and technology blueprints to places like Libya, uh, Syria, Iran, North Korea. And when A.Q. Khan's network got rolled up, when he was basically blown after the discovery of the almost turnkey production he was selling to Libya's Qaddafi, when Qaddafi finally turned it over in late 2003, um, A.Q. Khan was taken out of the picture. This gave North Korea and Iran a lot more incentive to collaborate with each other more directly on nuclear as well as missile matters. And you, if you go over the history of this, it's rich. This has real legs. Uh, a, a defector from North Korea came and gave fascinating testimony back around 2003 here on the Hill uh, concerning his trip to conduct a missile test in Iran. And there's lots of evidence of that kind of thing. Uh, at this point, what's going on with these two countries, North Korea and Iran, with their interest, mutual interest in developing nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them, is that they have a converging set of interests. It's become visible. There are, forgive me just for running over the basics here, two basic ways you make a nuclear bomb. One is you use uranium, you enrich uranium, and that becomes the bomb fuel. The other one is plutonium. And Iran has most visibly, clearly chosen the path of uranium. They're busy enriching it in the centrifuges. North Korea has been most visibly focused on plutonium with its Yongbyon reactor, which produced the plutonium, which we assume was used in the 2006 and 2009 nuclear tests. Well, last no North Korea for years has been accused of, by the U.S., of also secretly enriching uranium. Uh, and, you know, the side stories on this are are remarkable and many at this point. We know that North Korea helped the Syrians build a reactor that would have been used for plut plutonium production, which the Israelis destroyed in a 2007 airstrike. There's, there's lots of overlap here, which reportedly, by account of an Iranian defector, was, bank was supported, possibly financed by Iran. Um, and it's unlikely would have been built without the Syrians cluing Iran in. Uh, that wouldn't have been a very safe move. Um, but North Korea has basically been working on plutonium until recently, when finally, after much denying, admitting, denying back and forth in usual North Korean style, they finally treated an American physicist, Siegfried Hecker, to a tour, or to a look at least, of their lovely new uranium enrichment facility uh, last November, or last, last fall when he was visiting Pyongyang. And this was clearly meant to advertise. They were no longer being secret. They took him into the control room and showed him rows of gleaming centrifuges. Now, there, there's some debate and discussion. It's unclear just how well all that works or exactly how extensive it is. But he returned to make his report. And in December, the Obama administration told the IAEA that there is evidence of additional uranium facilities in North Korea. Okay. And North Korean Iran and Iran cooperation on uranium matters also goes back. Iranians were helping North Koreans mine uranium back in the 80s. Okay. Well, these days, it looks like North Korea has a growing and at this point publicly advertised interest in the uranium path to the bomb as well as plutonium. Okay, there is now evidence, there have been reports pouring out of the South Korean press and other places since December that North Korea is now preparing for its next nuclear test. This would be its third. Um, I asked uh, one of my, thank you, one of my favorite North Korean experts, a guy who knows better than to call himself an expert but has spent years monitoring what goes on in North Korea. How do we know, when this sort of first turned up in December, how do we know that they're getting ready for their next nuclear test? He said, well, 
I like it because this guy reduces it to terms anyone can understand. Uh, he said, they're, big, they're digging a big hole. I said, I see. He said, and they're digging it in the same place where they dug the last two big holes. Okay, we can see this. And time is ticking by. They're going to be ready to do this. Now, the interesting thing is there's lots of speculation at this point over will this be another plutonium-based test or will this be a uranium-based test? In which case, now add to this one more thing. Iranians have been present at virtually all weapons tests, major weapons tests conducted by North Korea. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of collaboration both ways. I just mentioned the defector who testified about being at a missile test of a North Korean missile in Iran. In, in Iran. Uh, how do we know that Iranians turn up? Um, you can monitor our, our U.S. forces can monitor a lot these days, and among other things, they can simply see when, for the most part, when Iranians come and go from North Korea. You know, there may be other ways as well, but uh, there is good reason to believe that Iranians show up at these tests. What are they there for? Um, they're, again, a matter of speculation precisely what the terms of the deals are, but it's anything from possible cooperation on developing functional weapons, since they both got AQCONS blueprints, they've both been working on these things for years, they both have an interest in developing them, they've both made them, made nuclear weapons a pillar of their foreign policy. Uh, and the other one is that North Korea, forever hungry for cash, uh, is happy to have the Iranians there because it's kind of like con showing off your wares. You know, look at what we're producing now. Come and see. You're invited to and go home and, and to tell, them, tell them what we can now provide. Uh, that's a basic overview of what's going on. In the meantime, North Korea, both are at this point are under sanctions. As of 2006, the UN Security Council finally got around to putting sanctions on Iran and North Korea. Um, UN sanctions are always a leaky leaky sieve. It's, there are two basic problems there. One is the United Nations leaves it to member states to define exactly how they will comply with sanctions. So the UN says if a ship, there's reasonable probability that a ship is carrying, you know, a flag to North Korea is carrying suspect materials related to missiles or nuclear weapons, um, it can be interdicted on the, on the high seas, etc. However, it's up to individual states to decide what regime they will put in place, what legal regime, to actually do that. And then it's up to them whether they actually do it or not. And at this point, there, there were, after the North Korean 2009 nuclear test, there was a rash of seizures and visible attempts to stop shipping. Remember, just after the nuclear test, uh, the spring of 2009, there was a North Korean ship that set out possibly for Burma and U.S. The U.S. fleet shadowed it, and finally it turned back. And there was a ship seized in the United Arab Emirates, packed with weapons. There was a plane stopped in Bangkok that winter, packed with weapons. Well, for about the past year, there's been very little visible anything. Treasury has designated a number of North Korean entities, but uh, most of the attention has gone to Iran. And one of the things I'd just like to set out here as a reminder today is that North Korea is not only sort of a handy back door, it's a time-tested, long time, from the beginning of the Islamic Republic partner, which is already advanced beyond Iran, as far as we know, in its ability to make and test nuclear devices, has been a purveyor of missiles for a long time. And uh, has also been a trailblazer in the sense of showing just how much you can get away with as a rogue state which says we're just going to make nuclear weapons, we don't care what you do or what you say because we know you're not really going to attack us. You're going to sit back, as in that editorial of almost 20 years ago, make a fuss but do nothing. Finally, a last note, as you might have noticed, Jimmy Carter has been back in North Korea. All the stars are again aligned for another one of these deals with North Korea, none of which has ever worked out. North Korea has cheated on every deal it has made and cheated to its great advantage because it, North Korea takes whatever it can get in the meantime. The last round 
it got free food, free fuel, got off the terror list, got a whole host of diplomatic respect and concessions. Um, North Koreans have been, again, there, were, there, was, uh, there was a team recently in New York, they got a tour of Google headquarters in California before they went home. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Carter is just now on his way back from Pyongyang having announced the message as the faithful message boy, actually he sounds ever more like he works for the North Koreans, having announced that North Korea is now, having last year sunk a South Korean Navy ship and shelled a South Korean island killing people, is now happy to talk without preconditions about absolutely anything, presumably including you know, French art. But uh, all, the, all the pieces are in place to start for the U.S. to now do one more Charlie Brown and the football grab for a North Korean nuclear deal, in which case, once again, the pressure from our diplomatic corps will be all on Treasury and anyone else trying to actually chase down this nexus I've just described will be to leave them alone lest it queer the deal, which is very much what happened four years ago with the last nuclear freeze deal, which fell apart predictably enough. So it's just to say we tend to focus on everything radiates out from the U.S., but if you look across between Iran and North Korea at what's been going on with these two for, at this point, where are we, 80, more than 30 years, it's substantial. It continues to this day. A UN panel, the UN has sanction, panels of experts who report on how well sanctions are being complied with by member states. Sometimes these are nonsense exercises. They had a serious panel last year, which reported back that North Korea was still shipping weapons to Iran in violation of UN sanctions. There's another report which this panel, with some slight alterations of personnel, produced in January on the North Korean uranium program. Uh, the Security Council has been sitting on it. It has not been publicly released, although bits of it have been leaked to the press because China doesn't want it out there. I leave you with that thought and happy to answer your questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Claudia, thank you very much. I apologize for being late, folks, um, but I'm delighted that you were not and uh, that I caught most of what you had to say, I think. Um, before uh, asking questions, I wanted to just say we have found in the, um, uh, the previous sessions uh, that some of the most useful information that uh, comes out of our speakers and, uh, and the conversation we have with them is actually in the Q&A section. Um, as you know, we videotape these. We have been uh, transcribing with uh, Ben Lerner's considerable help and editing um, them into uh, terrific quarterly uh, products that uh, I think have considerable value beyond the uh, immediate audience, um, as do these videotapes on, on YouTube. Um, what we would like to do, with all of your permission, is uh, do the same for the Q&A. And we can obscure the names of people who, or faces of people who don't want to be seen. In fact, I guess the faces won't be on in any event. But um, we can obscure if you do introduce yourself to our guest, um, your name, if you wish. So just mention that you'd like the uh, your your participation to be off the record, and we will take sure take care of that. But I, I do think it's important to have the benefit of um, the further conversations if we can. So if that's agreeable, we'll. We'll do that. Um, let me just ask a first question, Claudia. Uh, in the way you've um, uh, you, you've posed the proposition that the next North Korean test, which uh, it certainly sounds as though it's in the offing, um, may be a uranium test, and observe that the Iranians have been pursuing uranium also. And the question occurs: Might the next test be a test of an Iranian nuclear weapon? under the auspices of the North Koreans? Frank, I can't give you any factual answer for that. Uh, we simply don't know. If anybody knows, I certainly don't. It's not an open source material. Um, it, uh, it's possible from the, peop the sources I talk with, so this is speculation, please understand. Uh, it's more likely that it would be a North Korean produced device which the Uraniums, your Iranians would be invited to, yeah, exa exactly, precisely, to take away what they wish to pay for from. Um, 
but it's not impossible. You know, there's been speculation for some time. We, what we know is that these tests take place. What can be reasonably documented in many cases is that Iranians are there. Uh, what the business terms are, we would all love to see. You know, one note, remember when the Iraqi regime fell, it turned out that Saddam Hussein had kept meticulous records of his deals. You, you sort of have to if you're a dictator who wants to make sure that you really keep control and people don't steal from you. Uh, you need a lot of bookkeeping. And there must be records of the deals that are actually done. Uh, all I can say is in the event that either regime suddenly collapses, it would be a very good idea if U.S. officials had a team ready to go right in and get those records, because the next thing that happens is they disappear. Great. Thank you, Claudia. Marshall. From the uh, flip side, Mike. Uh, similar question, though. It's been said that with enriched uranium, even a high school student can build an atomic bomb. Uh, could this be a reflection that since the first test that North Korea did was really a fizzle, uh, where they only got a one kiloton output when all experts thought it would be between 10 and 12, the next bomb seemed to do about what was anticipated. May they be finding that an enriched uranium is an easier uh, radioactive material to work with, and they're pulling away from the plutonium. It's possible. You know, on that, I would say you want, you want somebody more expert in the actual workings of nuclear warheads. Um, but what is clear is that North Korea has been diversifying its portfolio for a while, and they're willing to try a variety of avenues. And, in fact, that's consistent with the behavior that you see both Iran and North Korea engaging in, where they're both trying to do something that the, the so-called international community, with America basically doing the, all the heavy lifting, wishes to prevent. And for that, they've developed staggering networks. I mean, huge global networks, complex, fascinating. It's an amazing puzzle of front companies, uh, complicated overlapping shipping routes. Um, if you look at how the Syrian, the North Korean built Syri reactor in Syria that the Israelis destroyed four years ago. If you look at how that was supplied, it involved routes, uh, it involved a purchasing agent in Vienna, affiliated in fact with the UN's own International Atomic Energy Agency. <laughs> uh, and so it's possible that part of it is technical. It's also, I, that may be one of the factors they're weighing, but there's also, it's also quite likely that another factor in this very complex equation that both countries and some of their other partners. Remember, this is part of a wider web, uh, which also includes countries that have shown an interest. And at this point, there's some, there's, are plenty of reasons to wonder, is Venezuela involved in this? Is Brazil involved in this? Are there countries in Africa that are involved in this? And so on. But uh, it's something that there's a lot of incentive to do anyway. Um, if you if you narrow your target, you make it easier for some place like the U.S. to block you. If you try many, many ways, something may work. And also, just a thought, it could be perhaps an exportable uh, product that they're looking at developing as well. One should completely assume that with North Korea. They are, I mean, this is useful for them because it, it is a, a guarantee as far as they have come to see it that nobody will touch them. In fact, it was interesting when Gaddafi gave up his nuclear kit at the end of 2003 and then got into all the trouble he's been in for the last two months with, you know, uh, one of the things that North Korea said, well, look, you know, it's obviously a very bad idea to give up your nuclear weapons or your nuclear program. Gaddafi didn't have the actual weapons yet. But, yeah. 